I'm Jamie Wyland, and this is Appetite for Distortion. Before I start my chat with Brando, I'd really like to take a moment to dedicate this conversation to Scott's amazing fans that have continued to love and remember him and the incredible music that he created. I consistently receive the most beautiful messages of you sharing what his music meant to you, how it got you through battling addiction, losing a loved one, needing to feel empowered, falling in love, figuring out what you wanted to do with your life, finding success and joy. His songs have had such a powerful influence on so many people in so many ways for so many years. And I am beyond honored to hear those stories. And I realize that you sharing these things with me helps you keep him alive. But I also want you to know that sharing these stories helps me keep him alive too. You know where you are! This is Appetite for Distortion. Welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode number 460. My name is Brando. Welcome to the podcast, Ms. Jamie Wyland. How are you? I am good. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to get into it and talk about some stuff. You seem like I'm just looking at you if you're watching on our YouTube channel, getting into it, getting your hands dirty seems like a common theme for you being an artist and all the paintings behind you and all the, uh, the, the, what is, the, is there an official name for like those painters drawers? Like, is there, is there, oh, are the you, flat, are flat files? Yeah. The those flat are, files. yeah, those are cool. They're, um, I don't know, probably 50 or 60 years old. They were a gift from a friend. They came from a local college that was clearing out a library and I was lucky enough to get one, but yeah, they're cool and they're very functional and they, they make my studio look legit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same thing here. I try to have legit. I don't know if you can see over my my left shoulder. I told you. So yeah, this is a good week for me to do interviews because my wife and my son took a vacation without me. They're in the oh. upper peninsula of Michigan, which is fine. I we just went to London. I need a vacation from that vacation. I don't I'm I'm fine being alone. But she yeah. got me for Father's Day. Uh I don't know if you've ever seen them. If you're on, on like any of the social media, there's always these ads that come up to put your loved one or your animal in a like a renaissance kind of looking painting so yeah. there's like one year old's head on like napoleon's body <laughs> I, I was and my say, cats as well <laughs> i was gonna say i think i see some cats in uniforms and i love that. I know. so that's that's my studio looking professional uh so i'm in forest hills queens new york would you mind if i ask where your your studio is unless it's a secret location oh uh, i'm in los angeles okay when you, I talk to so I keep saying it. I talk to so many people from LA. Obviously, doing a, a, a Guns and Roses themed podcast. I have never been. It'll happen. I know. You've never been to LA. No, I know. My it took me long enough. I'm glad that my wife's a traveler, as you could tell. So we will go there. But I've just been consumed with my my work, and I never really traveled. You know, only traveling for work for for so many years. So right. anyway. Enough about me. I want to learn about okay. you. And the uh, come to LA. Uh -huh. I can give you the breakdown of like where you need to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The beaches you need to go to that nobody else knows about. Like I'm, I'm very much an LA girl in the way that I I kind of know all the secret cool stuff. So okay. yeah, it's, you know, let me. That's a good transition because uh. Actually, one of my I'm the oldest of four. So one of my brothers had lived in LA in a couple of years, uh, for a couple of years. He just moved back. Maybe he might go back, but still he talks about the just the way the maybe not like a culture shock for him, but just a different way of life. I and mean, that's coming from New York to LA. You, yeah. you're from Canton, Ohio, right? Canton, Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A home of the the football hall of fame. Football Hall of Fame. I've never gone to the football hall of fame because I don't care about football. <laughs> Um, I hear it's really cool. <laughs> it's 
<laughs> yeah, man, I it's I've never I've been to the baseball hall of fame. That's all I, it's the only one that really I care I about. I would much rather go to the baseball hall of fame. Yeah, Cooperstown, New York. Yeah. So yeah. let's kind of go back to Canton to to little Jamie. To, did yeah. you ever foresee did you always know that as I'm teaching my one year old now what how to hold a crayon, right? Yeah. And try to he's more interested in eating it and, and putting it maybe back in the box and doing anything with it. When did you realize you wanted to be an artist and, and to paint and to draw and take photos? Um, how, how young? Um, the photography, I was in the sixth grade and my dad was an amateur photographer and I was just really enamored of his cameras and his lenses. And um, I just felt that I needed to be taking photographs. And my dad gave me my first camera, which had been his first camera, which was a Minolta from the sixties. The light meter didn't work. And I had no idea what I was doing. So he hands me this camera and I'm like, dad, the light meter doesn't work. And he hands me a steno pad and a pen. And he says, write down every exposure and the ISO of your film. And when you get your film back from being processed, just kind of, you know, cross-reference what worked, what didn't work, mm -hmm. which was an incredible gift for him to give me because to this day, I basically don't use light meters. I can, if I know my ISO when I was shooting on film or now shooting digitally, of course, for 20 years, um, I can look at light and I know what is supposed to work. I'm not relying on a device to tell me. Um, so thanks, dad. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's something that you, you said right away that I think about often, you know, somebody who takes a million photos of their cat, of my cats and baby, and then just so easy with filters and to make it look good. I mean, yeah. how do you feel that somebody who started when you had to go through, you know, the process to, of being a, a photographer and not just literally have it all handed to you in your hand? It's literal. The actual word of the use literal, it's handed to you. Uh, it, I have to say it annoys me a little bit. Because, <laughs> right. Yeah. I processed all my own film. I printed everything in a dark room by hand. And, you know, there, I, the trend of photographers that legitimately know the craft I feel is kind of falling to the wayside because the kids that are coming in that just really know how to use Photoshop and I've shot with these photographers as a model and I've worked with them and it's just kind of like shoot everything, just shoot everything. Don't light anything properly. Don't frame it properly. Just da -da 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 -da. And then afterward in Photoshop, you make it look pretty. Mm. That degree of, first of all, I feel like it's laziness. On the other hand, I also feel like really understanding Photoshop and how to use that tool is a whole other art form. True. But I, I, I don't know. My, my son is, um, he's a film major and I am on him all the time about learning how to properly light everything. And I make him shoot stills. He's got to shoot stills. I feel like the best director should also know how to take a still photo. So, um, I don't know. I'm rambling. <laughs> no, you're answering the question, uh, exactly how I hoped you would answer. Cause that's how I feel. Uh, even, uh, I've taken nothing of your level, but, you know, photography classes in middle school, but even as a, you know, learning journalism and as an undergrad and knowing the camera, you know, I had to learn the other side, how to frame things and how to, you know, white balance and all of that. And seeing yeah. how easy that is to do today where you can just swipe and it makes it lighter. Uh, just, but it's a completely new, like you said, talent to, uh, to know photoshop because yes well i can frame things and i i can make it just like this comparison like with tiktok like i look at the dumbest things but they're edited so well it's so they're so well and i'm like i'm jealous i'm like the content is stupid but i really like your editing skills i don't know if there's a talent in there i don't know if that's the best analogy but that's the one i got uh, no it is a good analogy <laughs> there are you know the art art changes and it shifts and it evolves and being able to create a really cool edited tiktok video is a gift that i certainly don't have 
Um, there are, I, I mean, what we consider art, what we consider craft are two different things. Like maybe editing TikTok videos is more of a craft as opposed to an art because mm. you're not really creating something from here. It's very cerebral. Does that make sense? I feel like if I'm doing a painting, it's coming from here. Mm. And I feel like editing a TikTok video is you know what's going to look good. You have the machinery to do it, the tools to do it. It feels more like a craft as opposed to an artistry. And I think that that line is really misconstrued for a lot of people because a lot of people will tell me, oh, I'm an artist. And then I look at what they do and I'm like, no, you're crafty. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. The word artist is so overused nowadays. Like. <laughs> Artists yeah. used to be here. Uh, I don't. I, I don't mean to name them as because I'm a Nature Turtles guy, but actual Raphael and Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, those are, are artists, not yeah. Mr. Beast. Like <laughs> you know. <laughs> the, yeah. But I, then I also, I don't want to come across as arrogant because I doubt myself as an artist every single day. It's a huge right. hurdle for me. Every single day, I have to remind myself that I am creating something from here. And people seem to like it. Some people hate it, but that's okay. You can't make everybody happy. Um, so I don't I don't necessarily want to say that one is better than the other. Um, when I'm comparing them, they're just different. It's just sure. Different. So, yeah. So no, I, I, I completely understand what you're saying, and you're you're saying it much better than I would. So I appreciate that. Uh People know, like, because that's kind of the, the way that I look at radio and this podcast and all that is shaping the same thing. Is trying to find that balance, <laughs> excuse me, between being an artist and what's craft. Um, but people know my my because I'm a rock and roll guy, so somehow it's led me to do this this rock gene or podcast. What about you? What did you photo uh, photograph? Uh, when did it start with music with you? When did it start? When did you kind of maybe go that that route? Um. Well, starting with the music, I really was just photographing, you know, actors, doing their headshots, doing some kind of editorial type of stuff. Um, I shot a lot of kids. Um, and then I got a call from Scott's management because I knew a girl that worked there. And she said, we need a photographer on the set of his music video for his Christmas album for two days. And I immediately said yes and then that night went to bed going oh my god what did I agree to do oh god I can't do this I don't know what I'm doing um but this little voice told me to just go ahead and jump and do it and I did and that's how we met and it profoundly changed my life and the whole path of my life um, but after that, a lot of musicians started coming to me to photograph them, but I was still transitioning from shooting families. So when people were like, what do you shoot? I'm like, children and rock stars. <laughs> hey, it's both ends of the spectrum, right? Yeah, and they're, they're all wrong. crazy. So it's, you they're know. <laughs> yeah, who was hard? You know, it's like the, the phrase hurting cats. Yeah. <laughs> More difficult, children or rock stars, one they're and the rock. same. Rock sure. <laughs> kind of the same it depends you know and, you know i'm a mom i love kids i used to teach art to kids like i love children but um they're a lot <laughs> you're like i have a one-year-old i know i'm i'm learning that you know but they say and i'm sure you'll agree is you know like they grow up quickly which they do i mean in the one year I look back at pictures from a few months ago. I'm like, oh my God, like he was a nugget. And now he's like becoming like a little boy. It's, 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 uh, it's crazy. So yeah, but he's can only, he can stand, but he hasn't, he's not walking yet, but he's okay. crawl, everything climbing up on the couch, trying to grab everything in sight. So yeah, it's, it's funny. Cause uh, it, I need to, at some point get a camera behind me. Uh, so I can have like a baby cam while I'm doing these episodes. Cause sometimes there are episodes where I'm holding them. <laughs> it's, oh, I love that. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. It's, it's part of the show. 
uh, just to show that all the toys behind him and how close he tries to like get to pulling out all my wires. It's great. <laughs> Fantastic. So yeah, he's, he's getting there, but I love him. I wouldn't change him. I wouldn't change anything to the world. Best thing that's ever happened to me. And, uh, that kind of, maybe there's another transition there that kind of came out of trauma in a way, if you, if you go back to it. Um, cause I know you, you, you mentioned Scott and of course, um, let me just say, I am so sorry for your loss before we go anywhere else. Thank you. Uh, it, it's still a lot. <laughs> it's still a lot. And life has moved on. I've moved. I don't know. I can't say I've moved on because you don't move on. Things just change. But it's always there. It's always there. And I feel like it's there in a really peaceful and beautiful way now. But it was terrifying to me for a long time in many ways, like how everything happened and how visible it was to the world and what people thought and people's misunderstandings. And that will never, like, I'm not going to sit down and explain to everybody what was going on in his life or my life and clarify everything because a lot of it is just nobody's business. And a lot of it is not something that could be understood, but I do I do like conversations like this where I feel like I can clarify some things because a lot of these misunderstandings are deeply troubling to me. Um, and I, I do want to clarify a lot of things. Um, but then there is also stuff that I'm like, I will never talk about. I just won't. He, uh -huh. he would be mad at me <laughs> if I did. <laughs> I, I mean, I could, I understand. I know people say that's you and well, we spoke a little bit off the air about it and most of my listeners know, but I, I was a little surprised where it was a couple episodes ago where people who had been listening to me, but didn't know my story. Uh, so yeah, this is just, cause there's a lot of crazy parallels because whenever we talk about Scott or we talk about Chris Cornell or Chester Bennington, my mind immediately goes to my dad and it's kind of crazy you know, having grown up listening to these, all these rock stars and now thinking about my, my dad who passed away in 2013. So okay. it was, thank you. And it's, what do you say? You know, it's kind of, it's, it, it's, cause I say from depression, but we all know what that means. I'm just trying to say it in a, as to normalize it, I guess, in, in a way. And actually uh, on the 6th, so yeah, just uh, like six days ago, it was the 11th anniversary of it. And I'll admit this, I because it, it's with me every day, like you said, it never goes away. Uh, he's the, you know, when my brother is the background to my phone. Uh, so that's been like that for, you know, 11 years. But it took my, one of my brothers to remind me because I knew it was around now, but it's one of those dates that goes in and out because you're living with it every day. And what I think about, you know, in addition to my dad, you know, just the, the obvious of uh, people might ask, you know, whether it's the, the why, or he was that sad or uh, over medicated. I mean, he was a dentist, relatively successful, but you find out he was in debt after partially why, uh, which is a, unfortunately a common problem. I know you've spoken about, you know, Scott and his affairs. Uh, so it's a, a dentist to rock star. So when I've had these conversations with um, Dave Navarro, still one of the best, you know, conversations I've ever had because he's just said like what, you know, the, the people will look at, because he spoke about specifically Scott and Chester. He's like losing all these people so close to each other. Uh, but it's like they had everything. How can they do this? Well, it's not about that. It's about deeply rooted trauma. So I think about with that, and knowing that I'm a child of and have a, I have family surviving of somebody like that and I'm not a public figure, I just think I read the comments what people say, whether, again, it was Scott or anybody, and people assuming things about their lives. And I'm like, holy shit, if I was a public figure, I would freak out. I would freak out. I had one person who left, I may have said this before, because as I mentioned, my dad was a dentist. 
you know, on Yelp and all that stuff. Somebody left a comment, how can I review a, a dead guy? And that, like, I'm like, are you, what kind of person says that? That's so weird. Uh, and just, to, again, that's one comment that stuck with me all these years later. So I, I can't imagine what you see and read on a on a daily basis in addition to your grief. So that's like, it just, it breaks my heart. It really does. So I just needed, I don't know if there's a question in there, but I kind of just needed to uh, just express that this is where I'm coming from. It's not just saying I'm sorry. People need to realize that these are human beings. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and really when you, when you extract the fame from it, it really is just another human being who has been through some shit and doesn't know how to handle it and makes some choices that end up ending their lives. Yeah. And it, it's tragic. It doesn't like fame to me doesn't mean anything. It's just this peripheral part of someone's existence, but the actual soul in the mind of people is still fragile. It's so fragile. And it can easily be wounded and it can easily go off on these really tragic paths and it hurts everyone around them and it leaves everyone so sad and they don't want that. They don't want to hurt anyone, but they don't know how to not. Does that make sense? It does because, and again, this is why the, the reason why I'll mention again, continue to mention my experience because it's going to be a common I think people are going to relate to it uh, if they haven't had this issue in their life is that, you know, my, my dad was a great, great dad. Like I never doubted how much he loved me, but he had anger issues, depression issues that just made it very difficult to be around. You know, it's one of my great regrets of just how short my phone calls would be with him at the end, because he would just be carrying this weight of just like I depression and I'm like, and I was, well, I never, I don't want to um, over exaggerate it and make it seem like I made an attempt, but I was pretty, I was like, I didn't want to be here. You know, I'm like, I'm, I'm sad enough as it is. I can't, I, I don't want my dad to know how sad I am, ironically. <laughs> so it's, but again, I, I'm not, nobody does how would have to know the story outside my family, you know? Yeah. Um, but within that, there's, family issues you know i don't talk to one side of my family because of it and i tried to fix that it's it's uh it's but again getting these things off when you're talking to uh daughtry and uh jacoby from papa roach a couple episodes ago about their their loss and how they they find healing through music i mean what have you is it through the painting is it through you being an artist that because this, it's crazy. This podcast is how I've, in addition to my therapy and everything, has helped me. Uh, you know, so what do you do to kind of, I don't know, get through? You know, again, we're never going to get over it, but to kind of, I don't know, be okay with everything and find find an outlet to express yourself, a healthy outlet. Definitely the painting, and um, you know, it's funny because. I had just started painting right before Scott died, right before he died. And he was so supportive of it. Like every little sketch thing that I did, and it kind of came out of nowhere. I don't know if I told you the story. I'll just digress really quickly. I wasn't, I'd always wanted to be a painter. And have you ever done the Proust questionnaire? It was question was it's always in the back of vanity fair they always do it with a celebrity it's like these 20 basic questions that kind of define who you are as a person okay and somewhere i have scott and i were on tour and i was like let's do the proust questionnaire because it's really a great way to understand someone and in mind one of the things i said that i ultimately wanted in my life was to be a painter and a couple months before he he died i had gone to trader joe's and I came home and I was unpacking the groceries and we were folding up the bags in the kitchen counter. And I said, do you ever look at paper and see an image? And he looked at me like I was completely crazy. And I was like, hang on one second. 
And I ran upstairs and I found a little thing to paint and a brush. And I came down. And I'm like, look, there's like a soldier's face in this bag. Again, he's looking at me like I'm crazy. And so I just sketched it out really quick. And he's like, baby, that's crazy. I'm like, isn't that, I don't know where that came from. And it just ignited something. I mean, I could not stop painting. And then when he died, my painting turned to painting him because when I would look into the paper or the canvas, all I could see was him. And bringing him to life on paper and on canvas was so helpful and cathartic for me. And it also, like I said, like it brought him to life a little bit, like especially when I would get the eyes dialed in and I would kind of talk to him while I was painting him and when he'd be fun, or I'm sorry, when he would be done, um, when he would be done, I would look at him and I'd be like, there you are, there you are. And and then of course I took a lot of shit for selling those paintings because people were like, you're monopolizing on his image. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one finger salute. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think you can't tell people had to grieve and like, monopolizing i'm sure that a, a painting bought you a car i mean i don't, I don't understand uh i i don't i don't know I, that's i don't agree with that i don't agree with people who say that it was first and foremost but to, to tell people how to grieve uh also i think is what a mistake and that's happened within my family where you know are you crying enough uh for some people or um you don't seem sad, but you're inside. You're just trying to hold it together. Like you're yeah. inside, you're dying, you're, you're dying, but outside you're keeping it. So it's, I think it's just such a, a, a cross of a boundary really. And that's just the culture we're in. It's not just in this situation of just telling people how to live their life. Um, especially when it surrounds a death, like you didn't love him or care about him. I mean, it's, uh, it's it, it, yeah. it's 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 ins insanity to me you know if, if you want to i don't know you're supposed to <laughs> just send like a, like a t-shirt cannon just like with all these uh paintings to, uh, i don't know i just it's just it, it bothers me see i get like flustered because because it bothers me when certain people say things like that and this was a this was a comment that just happened because i just i've just been posting last couple of days have been velvet revolver show anniversaries and I'm just sharing photos of, of these shows from 2004, 2005. And a, a word that comes up, and it bothers me every time, but I don't I don't try to really like yell at people online until they become like nasty and rude. It's yeah. trying to, it's just trying to change the perspective of the word uh perception, I guess, maybe junkie. The word junkie. Yeah. I hate that word. It's so dismissive to who they are as a person. Yeah. Um, it took me a long time. It took me to become an alcoholic, to really true, truly believe in alcoholism. I'm like, why don't you just stop? Well, yeah. I couldn't just stop until my therapist yelled at me and, uh, you know, and I wanted to better my life finally. Yeah. So it's, that, that's a word that's, um, uh, I'm just, I want to navigate this more towards the positive because it's so much negative out there. We can just yell, uh, we can yell at these people for being nasty online, but we're here to kind of paint a picture of what Scott was really like, even with these demons. Yeah. Yeah, so, he was he was the most beautiful human I've ever known, other than my son. <laughs> so like let's 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 backtrack just a, a little bit to that first day uh when you met him on set. And this is coming from a Jew. I love that Christmas album. It is <laughs> it's so good. I mean, it just showcases what a brilliant talent and voice because how many people try to do a christmas album like uh, too many to, to name and right. a lot of them are embarrassing oh but some of them are so good like because like i that's... i love christmas i'm an atheist but i love <laughs> christmas so much so the christmas music it starts december 1st but like i mean weezer's christmas album okay like <laughs> I, I love when I love when rock stars kind of step out of their thing because they just are people that love Christmas 
And that's how Scott was. Scott just loved Christmas and he loved singing Christmas songs. And he didn't care what anybody thought about it. He was like, I'm going to make a Christmas album. And he did. And it was great. So it really, whenever I go to my friends, uh, George and Julia out on the East coast or the East side of Long Island, it's always Scott Wyland Christmas while they're putting the tree up. And since, well, I guess technically I'm agnostic, but I was raised a Jew and I'm a bitter Jew about Christmas because well, now with my kid, well, we're going to have to celebrate both. I'm like, oh, now I'm going to have to tell him that Santa's real. Like, oh, my God. But I guess I have to. But <laughs> while well, listening to his, his, his end of my stupid story, uh, listening to his Christmas album, because my friends would get me an ornament. And since I'm a Jew, uh, one year it's like a little menorah ornament. One's <laughs> it's, it's a little bagel with locks ornament. It's, it's funny. It's fan- good times. See, good memories. <laughs> Sorry, you were the Zoom uh, cut out your audio there. Oh, I said, do do you put up a tree? Yeah, so my wife puts up a tree, but I made sure not only to get uh, a menorah, a dinosaur menorah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, No, my my first husband, my son's dad, is Jewish. Okay. Yeah, growing up, it was, but he's very, he's kind of agnostic Jewish, um, like you. But yeah, it was always like, how do we maneuver these holidays? Like, do we just do both? And then I'm like, this kid's going to get so many gifts. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I, know, I know. Well, I don't know. He'll, he'll learn. If I really want to teach him, it's like Hanukkah is really just to compete with Christmas. I mean, we have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur that are more popular, but still that menorahsaurus will be used by him. <laughs> I'm afraid of a dinosaur menorah and I'm going to have to probably get one. <laughs> So uh, to go back a, a little bit when you first met, and I think this is important. Uh, so my mom tells me the story of when she first met my dad. And uh, a, a, a friend of theirs said, oh, he's had issues, but he's okay now. <laughs> okay, okay. And he was okay. He was fine. But he had been in like therapy before, like from the, when he was like 19. I don't think they met until their, their early 20s. Yeah. So you, I mean, that's just one friend telling another friend something. You obviously know who Scott Weiland is and all the stories. I mean, how do you even approach that? How does that even happen? Is it like, no, no, Scott, you're not getting this. Or like, wow, he's really handsome. Like, I, I got to talk to this guy. <laughs> how, does, uh, how does that happen? Because he's a handsome guy. You're a beautiful woman. That must be a problem for both of you growing up all like all these years. Oh. Don't be done. I don't know. I don't know what that's, what that's like. Well... I will tell you that the day I met him, the first day of his shoot, I was so nervous. I was so nervous. And because, so, you know, I, I graduated from high school in 1996. And in the mid-90s, in the mid-90s in Ohio, you were either a Pearl Jam Eddie Vedder girl or you were an STP Scott Weiland girl. Clearly, I was a Scott Weiland girl. Um so it was meeting one of my idols, but it was also a job and I had to be focused and get my work done. And the first day he basically wouldn't look at me mm. and I would catch him every once in a while, kind of sort of looking at me. And if I made con- eye contact with him, he would just kind of like dart his glance elsewhere. That sounds like me. like trying to avoid somebody I like. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I could feel him looking at me. And then that night when we left, his car was parked next to mine and I was loading all my gear into the back of my, my car. And I said, have a good night. And I remember he had like his trench coat on with a, you know, the collar turned up and he just kind of went, mm. and I was like, <laughs> oh, all right. And then the next day we were at a different location and all my gear was set up outside and Scott kept coming out to smoke cigarettes. And later he told me, he's like, I just wanted to come out and hang out with you because all I could think was, I mean, I know this guy's a smoker, but dear God, does he smoke a lot? Like who smokes this much? And the story, which I'm sure any interview of, you know, me, it's, you know, how we kind of broke the silence was that he was standing in front of a fireplace and I was photographing him. He was wearing a starched tuxedo shirt and he was a little paunchy. 
And as I was photographing him, I was going, I can totally retouch this. I'm really good at Photoshop. But then I was tired and a little annoyed by certain other people on the set. And I was just like, you know what? Fuck this. I don't want to touch this. And so I said, you know what? I need you to just like suck it in a little bit. And the look on his face, because no one spoke to him like that. Right. Everyone was Oh, Mr. Wyland, Mr. Wyland, we need you here. We need you here. And I was just like, dude, you got to suck it in. I don't have time for this. And he cracked up. And then, yeah. And then we were just hanging out outside with me and my gear and him chain smoking a lot and really slowing down the production of the shoot, by the way, because he was outside talking to me and smoking so much. And then at the wrap that night, he was parked across the street from me. And so again, I'm loading my gear in, except this time he came over and he said, thank you so much for everything. Like, it's been really great working with you. And we always said, like, we had a hug. And in that hug, we both knew. Like, it was like a magnetic force. Like, our hearts connected. It's, I don't even know how to describe it, but it was magic. And, um, yeah, so that's how it started. That's well, how it started. That's, that's, that's very sweet, and I appreciate you sharing that. And now I feel like I'm sucking my little punch. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't see the lower half of me, thank God. Uh, <laughs> that That's that's brilliant. So, you know, I've I, we all know, like, again, it, the story, oh, I, I wish because we can hold on to those moments, and I'm so happy when you – when it is an anniversary – you post a photo of just the most loving memories because uh, it's that's how I I think how it's how people who loved him as fans or loved him as a wife want to remember. It's the same thing with like with my dad. I don't remember the bad. I mean, I do, but that's not what I that's not what I take with me like, right. at all. That's not that's not what I take with me. It's just part of it. Yeah. But. You know, I, I can trace back as, but my perception is going to be different than my, my brothers who are younger because I moved away to college and you want to talk about maybe like the last five years of his life, just being more stressed, more depressed, just being a little bit different and where they're still living at home. So my, I only had like on the phone, a lot of media scene when I would come home from, from college or wherever I was living at the time to see a, a, a difference. And, you know, maybe I could pinpoint it to, you know, he had a motorcycle accident where his foot basically fell off. It was like, yeah, he, uh, you know, he had a little bit of a midlife crisis, I guess. Well, I mean, he's always been one to kind of be like a, a bad boy, rock star dentist, if you could be one. But he had, uh, he loved his sports bikes and my mom being none of that. <laughs> you can't, you can't have those. Right. Well, he he hid them at a friend's house, and one time he got into an just driving to meet some friends at Jones Beach and went to dr go drive away, and like the, the sand got caught in the dirt, and yeah. like his foot got caught. He told me like it was hanging on by like a thread, and the fact that they were able to reattach it, it was is I don't know a miracle of modern science. But I know that was a major that was one of the major factors of just like a turn in his personality, Scott. You know, what, and as we discussed off air, whatever you're comfortable talking about, where did you notice the change? Because there always have there had been issues before with him, and you know, in his past, you're meeting him later on in life. Uh, but when did you notice a change? Because you read interviews about with him about you, you brought out the best in him. He he would say, "She sees me for who I am." Um, so it's kind of like if if he got that. You know, I always say if my dad or if anybody who unfortunately isn't around enough, you just kind of almost need that one person, that one thing to hold on to. And it's frustrating when like it was right there. You didn't see it. You should have held on to it. That could have helped you. That's how I feel. Anyway, I, now I'm going off on a tangent. But was there a, a moment for you to like, you know, like, okay, maybe this isn't. This, man, I don't want to say this is not what I signed up for, but like, okay, something's wrong here. Help is needed. What do I do? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like, when did it kind of change for you from that 
the wonderful first, uh, you know, day. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty early. Um, pretty early. I was, I remember being at his house one night and he, so I was going through a divorce when I met him and, but the divorce wasn't final, but he had assumed it was. Okay. And, and I told him that it wasn't. And all of a sudden, this whole other person came out. And he was very jealous and paranoid and suspicious. And I remember texting a friend of mine that night and saying, this, this beautiful love that I have maybe isn't real because something's wrong. And I really like Scott did not come with a handbook. <laughs> like I had no idea what I had gotten into, but I knew I was in love with him. And so every, every situation, every hurdle that would come up, I would just deal with it. And one thing that I had said to him very early on, because I had worked in production, um, doing production for photographers, and I hated working with people in the record industry because they all just seemed like, like, how do these people even sleep at night? They're all fucking liars. Like, I just want nothing to do with the record industry. And I had said to him from the get-go, I'm not going to be involved in your business at all. I won't do it. And then I realized how mistreated he was by his management, how people were stealing from him. They were lying to him. And I was fiercely protective of him. And it became abundantly clear that I was the only person that was actually going to protect him. And as hard as it was for me, because I was going through so much in my own life and trying to maneuver my own things and be a mom and everything else, I couldn't leave him alone to deal with any of that and I couldn't stand to see him being fucked over basically by pretty much everybody in his life um of course there are exceptions there are other people that were in his realm and eventually we got business managers and proper managers that really did care about him um but none of that would have happened if I hadn't been like fire this person, fire that person, because he would have just never done it. Because he was like, he was just so giving and so trusting. But then on the flip side, he was incredibly paranoid. Mm -hmm. And I had to be very careful, like if his, and it all came down to his medication. It was his medication. And as you know, he was bipolar. And if his meds weren't right, he was an entirely different person. And the paranoia was heartbreaking. His mom and I still talk about it, but I remember at the time we would talk about how, how fucking sad it was that he was living in this world where he thought people were out to get him. And it was really hard to watch, but then it was really hard too when it would turn on me um, I remember there was a morning I was driving him to um, an AA meeting, actually. And I went like this in the car. And he goes, who are you signaling? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you're signaling someone. I'm like, no, my face just itched. And on that same trip that morning, he thought he was seeing the same license plates on cars. And he thought we were being followed. And so I'm with this person and we're out in public and he thinks that people are chasing him, that I'm a secret spy and there's no one to help me. There is no one to help me. <laughs> and, you know, people, I'm sorry, I'm probably jumping ahead, but people can say whatever the fuck they want about things that I did or didn't do. But the truth was I did pretty much all the heavy lifting myself with him i was alone with him trying to keep him safe and keep him calm and get him to the right doctors and get him on stage get him to rehearsals all like it was just me i was the gatekeeper for everything um and that was really really fucking hard 
So when we talk about the comments that people make about me, about Scott, about our marriage, I basically want to tell everybody to go fuck off because they weren't there. They didn't know. And to judge and comment on it is just so low and ignorant. It's just ignorance. And that's why I was going to say this earlier when you were saying about, you know, that horrible comment on Yelp about your father and the horrible things that people have said about Scott, the use of junkie, all of that. I honestly stopped looking at all of this years ago. I just stopped looking. I don't, I don't read any of the comments. I don't read the articles about him. I don't even look because it's so upsetting to me that ignorance and that negativity and that judgment. I just, it, it makes me sick. It gives me anxiety. It depresses me. So I just don't look. I just don't look. You know, if it wasn't for this podcast, I would be off social media now. Uh, it's because it, it has gotten like that. Uh, yeah. What's, what's but, the, what's the point? Um, obviously there are, good things but you as you mentioned i don't need we don't need to backtrack over that but what what i will say it's wow it's like this is almost like a therapy for both of us because it's um it almost sounds like my mom and maybe i, I should call her uh, after this and apologize but it sounds like you know she was really the only one helping my dad where yeah. i didn't think where i thought she could have maybe done more or I get frustrated he didn't do this he didn't do that but she i know she did a lot uh, you know, I found out after my, my dad was a dentist, could prescribe medication. He would prescribe it to himself. He, uh, he would put medication underneath uh, my grandma's name and my mom's name, uh, cause he had arthritis and that was a big, uh, cloud over him being like, how do you be a dentist with arthritis? You know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it, 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 it is scary. And when you have those people who, Cause he was like that too, where he was, um, when you say Scott was very trusting, but paranoid, yeah. he thought people, I don't believe to that extent, you know, with, uh, license places, license pl uh, plates. Uh, but he was, he always thought people were out to get him. He just yeah. thought he was, you know, I'm not a good dad. I'm not this where he, again, he was a great dad and, but very trusting where people would take advantage of him. You would think, Oh, dentist, you make all this money. No, people would sue him for no reason. Uh, he would let people pay him later or installments and they wouldn't pay him, you know, because he was trusting. Yeah. So it's just, again, these parallels that I see that it's not just my dad and Scott. It's this is a human, you know, issue and how we look at things and treat other people. Uh, I do want to mention because I've had... Uh, I, I don't know your relationship with Doug Rion, uh, his uh, songwriting partner and Wild About Spam 8, but I, I had posted something uh, recently just transcribing. This was a few years ago. I, I did an interview with him, and it was the first one he did after Scott's passing. And he yeah. talks about, and he was honest, you know, about his addiction, you know, Doug's own addiction and everything, uh, about Scott's psychosis from prescription meds. Yeah. So that lines up with it. And uh, he said something that which is I think it's so important. And I made sure to, to include this into um, the written quote that I, I have. So if you don't listen to the episode, that there's a prescription medication epidemic in this country right now of epic yeah. of, of epic proportions. I mean, he said this in 2018, but it's still true. Uh, this is just one story in a big ocean of other stories about prescription meds, um, med medication abuse that ended with people dying. So. Uh, I, I'm assuming you agree with that because it's it's not all the the hard drugs. It's people get over the counter. It's it's uh or prescribed by doctors and, and abuse it. It's a scary, scary world out there. And I will say though, at the same time, without my medication, my uh sixty milligrams of Cymbalta, I I'm angrier, shorter fuse, sadder. So I need it. I mean there. Yeah. So there's a whole, you got to figure out what works for you and then have a good doctor that cares about you. Yes. Yeah. That was another thing with Scott is I very quickly took him from the doctors that he was seeing. And I started taking him to my doctors because I knew them and I trusted them. 
he at one point had this guy that would scott was on so much stuff he was on his bipolar meds he was on benzos he was just so much um no opiates no opiates he had been off opiates for 11 years when i met him um and he was absolutely clean um as far as heroin goes absolutely and he had this guy that would come to his house who i guess at some point had run a rehab and what this guy would do was take the medications from his wealthy clients basically other rock stars and he would I don't even know how this worked. This guy would like take some of the meds that like Scott had or his, you know, similar people. And he would give it to the people in the rehab that couldn't afford the medication. But then for medications that Scott couldn't get prescriptions for, he would get the prescriptions. He would bring them to his house. The whole thing was just disgusting and weird. And he had another doctor, what we call rock doc who will just prescribe anything. Um, And the rock doc I fired immediately. Um, And then I remember being at Scott's house one night and the guy that would have the rehab that would do all the switcheroos with the medication, he came in and I, I got up and I said to Scott, I was like, stay right here. And I told that guy, you need to leave. You're gonna walk out that front door right now. And if you come back again, I'm calling the police. I'm reporting you. Get the fuck out of here and stay away from him. Don't ever come around him again. I don't know. It's it's sad and disturbing that these drugs are out there um, and are just not placed properly in the right hands. And people are so over-medicated and... And they feel like shit. They feel like shit. So then they're taking more medication to feel better. And this pill has this side effect. So then they're taking that to handle that side effect. And, you know, the process just goes on and on and on. But Scott had an actual backpack of medication, a backpack of pills. And I couldn't even keep track of everything he was taking. Um, Now I feel like I've totally like gone off topic. But, no, we're. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, we're on topic because, um, you know, that that helps me bring up another point where, so I it wasn't just like at the uh, sixty milligrams of well, Cymbalta. It's deloxetine. That's the, uh, the the generic brand. But I didn't want to go on meds right away with my therapist when I started with her. What I'm like, well over a decade ago, and I said, no, no, it's we can fix this, and she gave me three months. And she's like, I can keep taking your money, but you're never going to get anywhere. So that was the whole medication journey. And yeah. I've been I've been on this version for a bit. I mean, there are crazy moments where I'm trying. It might have been Lexapro, and I remember I remember this portion of it. I was at uh, Subway, Subway sandwiches, the beginning of the line, getting my sandwich. I don't remember anything in between, and just paying. Like it's like my brain shorted out. Like I'm just what happened. So it's. It's amazing what it's amazing for lack of a better word that I don't have the vocabulary for of what medication can do with you, do to you, both good and bad. But I have said to her, well, because I do have bad days still and I kind of fluctuate. It's hard, you know, when you see those commercials, which are so what a scam for all these medications commercials, like, oh, I'm going to go to a doctor, I'm going to tell them what I saw on TV, but all these little add ons. I don't want to start going on that. I don't want to start this this path that I don't know where it's going to end. If I'm okay right now, even though I have bad days, I'm going to leave it like that. Because you, you do hear those horror stories of just you're chasing the dragon <laughs> in, in, in a way. I know they use, that's used for heroin, but in, in any sort of addiction. Uh, so, yeah, it's you are on path because I can, again, I can relate it to myself, relate it to my family, and I'm sure many people could relate it to theirs uh, who didn't have – a rock star in their, in their family. Uh, you know, once it goes back to what I said earlier. It didn't, Scott's mental illness had nothing to do with the fact that he was a rock star. It was just a chemical imbalance in his brain. So and, yeah, let, let me ask that then, because that's how I always feel with, you know, it's a chemical imbalance that I have, but I feel that some of my depression comes from, I know you can't tell with 
now because I'm sitting down, but I have uh, what's called a demyelinating peripheral neuropathy. It's basically the nerve version of MS. So I walk with a limp. I, uh, I have a cane and leg braces. I've started using a wheelchair to go to concerts. That's what I used in London. Uh, you know, had it. It's a mutation in the gene that's happened since uh, when I was like 10. So I'm like, oh, that's always been a part of my depression. Well, that's a part of it. I've learned because of what my, I guess on my dad's side of the family is that they have a history of mental illness. Uh, so I, I wonder, is it for him, was there, did he ever talk to you about, is it more than just this chemical imbalance? Was it certain things in his life where I had, you know, whether it be parent issues or uh, my, my self-loathing, like I could always say like, this is why, you know, uh, I, I'm unhappy. Uh, did he ever say to you, like, this is why I'm medicated or is it was it just the, hey, I have a chemical, I'm bipolar. This is just like being diabetic. This is just the medication I have to take. Or was it yeah. something tangible? Um, I think he had just been on medication for so long that he didn't know how to not be on medication or even what it was doing for him. And and let me also just interject with the fact that I I am not an anti-medication person. I absolutely think that we all might need certain things that are not herbs or CBD, you know? I mean, I've I've dealt with um horrible anxiety and depression since he died, like really bad. And I've been on meds on and off trying to maneuver all of it. So I'm not saying that all meds are bad and they're terrible and we should all be free and clear of them because that's definitely not the case. Um, but in his case, I do think he was on a lot of stuff that he did not need to be. And I do remember at one point he, I don't really understand how this worked because there would be times he would stop taking his medications and I could tell because the paranoia kicked in, his face would look like a different person. He would have a different look in his eye and I couldn't reach him. I couldn't reach him. He couldn't see me. Does that make sense? He was just this whole other, it was like he was possessed by some kind of vapid demon. I don't know, like it was just this blankness that would come over him. And all of the light and the beauty would be gone because Scott was, he was sunshine and he was brilliance and he was kindness and he was love and he was hilarious and he was brilliant. And when things would switch with the meds, he was a monster and he wouldn't even remember it after, you know, I would tell him the things that had happened and he had zero recollection. So what you're talking about at subway when you went from here to there and you're like i don't even like you blacked out that would happen to him too so i do get that um and it's terrifying it's terrifying what if you're driving a car and it happens you know and it gets it's scary my uh you know i'm not giving names here but what are my my brothers uh I'm, we're all medicated obviously <laughs> but it, he had a, a doctor that arm medicated him and he was driving and I had like a freak out. Like it could have went so bad. So yeah. it's like doctors, it's scary. Cause I'm lucky that I've, you know, my therapist is as caring as and she sends me to the right people, but there are ones that will be like, why am I on this? Uh, and, and, and something that's more, cause it's, it's actually what happened with my dad. My mom still tells this story. I'm like, you've told me, I don't need to keep hearing it. They're sitting at the kitchen table, and I know what you mean by the, like the vapidness, because uh, he would be like, it's like you're not present, like it's almost glassy eyed, and yeah. he was eating uh, like an ice cream, like a chocolate ice cream cone, and he fell asleep while eating it, and he was like basically finished. He woke up and he's like, "Who ate my ice cream cone? Who ate it?" Like really angry, I'm like it's it's on your face, you know. So it's. It's sad, but it's scary. And again, these these are moments that where I want to make a because a, 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 I don't want to keep you here forever, but I want to make an important pivot to my dad was awesome. 
Like he had these moments, but he was awesome. He was my biggest supporter in radio, listening to me since the first time I cracked a mic in college. I can only imagine what he would think now. You know, he would have been the best grandfather. You know, I, I, I talk about him to keep his memory alive for my own therapy. So my son doesn't go through what I went through, you know, and I say that because, look, I don't have any plans. That's that would be sick. But I mean, the fact that I'm sure he didn't when he was 40 and then he took his life when he was 30, uh, 59. So it's just all these thoughts go through your head. So it's like it's I, I'm letting you know that I. I don't want to sound corny. I feel your pain because, like, but it's like it sucks that this shit happens to us with people that we love. And again, on your side of it, there's the the press that focuses on the negative and sees the negative. So let's make the pivot to the parts that you loved and some maybe some special moments that you had with him that you'll you'll never forget. Whether it be um, at a show or something that I don't know that's that's a joke because you said he's funny you know a funny moment that happened uh let's let's talk some positive stuff uh yeah. <laughs> if we can sorry <laughs> um <laughs> i can send you some videos of like he was a goofball um like he and my son one morning um i think it was like i had gotten a new iphone and it had the like the slow motion option on the camera and they went outside and they spent like two hours taking slow motion videos of themselves jumping off the wall in the backyard. And they just thought that was like the freaking funniest thing ever. Um, he was a really great cook. He loved to cook and he was really good at it. Yeah, like fact, a special meal, like a special specialty. Um, Dover sole with a lemon beurre blanc sauce. The best. And I'm a really good cook, if I do say so myself. But I can never, I can never create, recreate his lemon blanc sauce. It was perfect. Um, he was just, he was just funny and very wry, highly intelligent. He knew more about American history and like World War II than anybody other than maybe my dad. And he and my dad, so I would always have calls with my dad on Sundays because my dad was back in Ohio and I was here in California. And I figure if it were Sunday in Ohio, I would go visit my dad. So we would just have these marathon phone conversations on Sunday. And I would pass the phone off to Scott. And he and my dad would talk for hours, for hours about airplanes and and different battles and generals. And like, and I would always, sorry, I don't know what's happening right now. No, that's all right. You got dogs going crazy? Yeah, I don't. I'm so sorry. Can, no, if you, if you need a pause, or are they pooping? I'll need a pause for one second. Let me just. Okay. I don't know. Okay, sorry. There's an alley behind me. Um, it gets noisy back there sometimes. Oh, a couple of alley cats causing some problems. The alley cats. No, the alley cat lives on my front porch. Oh. <laughs> Boiled rotten. Um. Anyway, so I would always joke with Scott. I'm like, you know, if the whole rock star thing doesn't work out, you can absolutely be an American history professor, which he could have been. And he talked about it. Um, I don't know. He was just very, very loving. When he was on, there was nothing like being around him. Like he was just the most singular person ever. He was, and it wasn't, I would tell him this. It didn't, it wouldn't have mattered if he had never written a song in his life. I was so connected to him. And he and I would talk about how we always felt like we'd known each other before. And he would ask me, I remember at the beginning of our relationship, he'd be like, are you sure you didn't come on the tour bus when I was in Atlanta? And <laughs> I was in high school, so I'm pretty sure. Also, if I had met you before, I would have remembered I had a poster of you on my wall. <laughs> like, um, I think that's so important. The fact that you went out of your way to say, you know, if you've never written a song, you know, you would have connected. Because I, I can I can only imagine that half these celebrities like, oh, you're only with me because of who I am. And 
Oh, right. Yeah. Well, there was also from, so when I was first with him, um, the shows he was doing um, were for the Christmas album. So I really just saw him on stage in a tuxedo crooning, singing Christmas <laughs> songs. They would throw in at the end, you know, one or two STP songs. But that was what I was used to. Very small venues with Scott in a tuxedo singing Christmas songs. And it made me a little nervous, but I was like, okay with it. And then we had come back to LA and there was a benefit at House of Blues that Velvet Revolver was playing. And that was the first time I saw Scott on stage as a rock star. And I remember standing in the audience and listening to the girls next to me freaking out about how hot he was. And I'm seeing him not crooning in a tuxedo, but like the full on, you know, Scott Weiland show. <laughs> yeah. And I thought I was going to hyperventilate. And I remember thinking, I can't do this. I can't do this. I cannot be a rock star's girlfriend. I am not cut out for this. So when people would say to me, oh, you just love being with a, you know, a rock star. I'm like, I actually don't. I actually prefer to just be home with my boyfriend who was you know before it was my husband obviously my boyfriend and just like watching movies and talking about books and cooking dinner and just being quiet and shut out from the whole world it was very 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 hard for me at the beginning to see him on stage it was really hard yeah, um that's true that's a good point where where I, you, you said it when you first met him it's a it's a different avenue you know, it's uh, he's Scott Weiland still, but not on that scale. Yeah. Uh, I was I consider myself lucky enough just to have seen him twice with Velvet Revolver, yeah. and it's like that's it's true. Like I can't believe it's unbelievable what a front man, an un underrated front man, uh, that he he was, and it wasn't just the singing; he was just the, the presence of it. Yeah. So I had listened to um, a previous interview you did about like a year ago about, you know, when, when certain artists are, are mentioned, you know, or celebrated that Scott's name isn't always brought up and you didn't mention any names, but I still took away from that being that's true. He was never really celebrated and you hope that's, and it probably is though, because of the negative surrounding him. And I want to break away from that stigma that doesn't take away from right. who he is as a person. So, what would you like to see happen? I mean, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is a joke anyway, Scott or no Scott, but I mean, that's, it's a Hall of Fame voice. I mean, yeah. that's, that's something I think fans would love to see. Um, do you have any, like, what, is there anything that you're doing to, or would like to see happen as far as what Scott's name uh, going forward? Because there were talks of, unreleased music uh from different places so i don't i don't know if you have anything um any knowledge with um an alien well, <laughs> i heard I that my computer oh, okay <laughs> my son um no i i feel like he really does not have the accolades and the respect and the recognition that he absolutely deserves. I feel like when he died, everybody was kind of like, that's tragic, but of course he overdosed, which he didn't fucking overdose, which I try to get that point across. He didn't because he had drugs in his system. The coroner had to rule it an overdose. But the truth is Scott died because the main artery in his left ventricle was 95% blocked. That came from 10 years of heroin use. That came from an entire adult life of chain smoking. It was his, his heart stopped. Did he have trace amounts of drugs in his system? He did. Did I know he was using? No, I didn't because he lied to me because I had caught him before and it would always be this huge fight. And I would be furious with him to, you know, and to be doing this stuff, but to also to lie to me about it. And I remember even talking to the coroner um, 
in in Minnesota when when everything happened and saying like how could he lie to me about this again and the coroner was so kind and he said I think he just really didn't want to disappoint you I know so but yeah I really want to clear up that was not an overdose it was not he was not using heroin he did not overdose on drugs his heart stopped because his heart had been through so much abuse because of prior drug use in his life and smoking and heavy drinking. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, no, I, I think it's important. That is important to, for everyone to to know and to understand and how easy and dismissive it could, it, it is just to say that like, Oh, of course. And then of course it's just this. Oh, yeah. and and it is I don't know. I'm just, when you're trying to get your life on track and, and do the right thing. And no, the, this, that's important. That's why, the distortion, get through the, the distorted truth, you know, the truth out there. That's that's why I named it this. Uh, yeah. but, but I think, and I I don't, I'm uncomfortable bringing it up, but I think it's because a lot of people saw that viral video of him before with, he was on stage and slowly putting on the jacket because it was alarming. Okay. So what happened with that, this is another thing I'm really happy you brought up. So that was another medication situation. He had been put on a medication for bipolar. And I saw it. He was very slow and sluggish. Like I would watch him try to lace up his boots and it was like he was in slow motion. And, but he had been on tour and there was nothing I could do about it until I got him back to LA. And once I got him back to LA, I took him to the doctor and the doctor immediately looked at him, his psychiatrist. And he was like, wow, yeah, we definitely, like he even said, he's like, we over medicated him. And once that medication was, you know, cut back to the dosage it needed to be, that went away. And then there are other things too that I've realized, like Scott had a thing where his ankle would give out and it happened a couple of times on stage and people thought he was drunk and stumbling. But then I realized because he had such severe liver issues that he was probably hypokalemic which means your potassium, like you, your body can't absorb and keep potassium and it causes muscle failure. It causes little like periodic moments of paralysis. So there was a time in an airport way to put him in a wheelchair because he couldn't walk, but it was all just mismanagement of medication and health concerns. And it was really hard to get all of that under control because he was touring so much. And everyone, you know, was mad at me. Like, how could you let him out on tour? How could you let him go on stage when he needed so much help? We didn't have a choice. He was so massively in debt. He had to go out and tour. So it was all this damage control and me trying to protect him and the band trying to protect him, Tommy Black trying to protect him. Everybody was in that. Toward the end, the whole crew with the Wild Abouts was amazing. Like the best tour managers, the best management, the best business managers, the best bandmates. Um, the loss of Jeremy Brown devastated him, devastated him. And, but that team, that became, and it's really sad because I feel like that really incredible family and team that were supporting him. And I was finally getting him with the right doctors and he was making progress with not drinking so much. All of it was like, moving along we were getting somewhere and then he died <laughs> like i don't know so and then there was the other there was the corpus christi video that one oh god that was when he like was completely singing off pitch and everyone thought he was on heroin again again it was medication and what had happened was his in ears had gotten wet so he couldn't hear anything he couldn't hear the band and everyone immediately just jumped to, Oh, look, Scott Weiland's on heroin again. Nope. That's not what was happening. People, not at all. And people were so nasty. I got so much hate mail. It was unbelievable. And when he died, I got a ton of hate mail. People would, would send me messages and say things like, uh, he probably died to get away from you um you stole all of his money no <laughs> actually 
for a long time, I was the one paying for everything and he had no money, but nobody ever wants to recognize that. And whatever, water under the bridge. But it's, it's just, it is that distortion of truth that people don't understand. And I'm happy to try and clear the air and people are still going to say shitty things. I remember one of the guys at TMZ would call me when around the time that Scott had died. Um, he would call me all the time and he said something to me once like, you know, if you can at least give us a statement, um, maybe people won't hate you so much. What? <laughs> like, who are these people? Like, <laughs> you're the worst thing to say. I don't anymore. I don't look because I, I just don't care. I can't. I'm not going to give energy to that group of miserable humans and their lack of intelligence and empathy. I just can't do it. And yeah, I know. I'm, 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 I'm on the same wavelength as you. So yeah. I forget the exact context, but somebody, you know, when I brought up my dad, who was on Twitter, uh, you know, talking about mental health and being like, "That's always your excuse that you know everything about mental health." You just bring up like your, your dad's suicide card. I'm like, who what kind of suicide card? Like, who, who says that? Or I, I, I telling you, I've heard it all, and I'm not famous. Uh, I showed a picture of. Again, as I mentioned, I, I've just started using a wheelchair in, in, in big places. So when we went to England, uh, to London, you know, we were, I took a picture. We took pictures everywhere, but uh, outside of Abbey Road Studios. And I'm in my wheelchair. I'm holding my son. My wife's, you know, leaning over, over whatever. And we had to get through. Everyone was just taking pictures through the gate, but the gate was open. So I'm like, it's kind of open. You see people there. I'm like, let's just go in like five feet. Let's take a picture. Who's going to yell at a guy in a wheelchair and a baby? So I kind of, I wrote that as the caption, a better phrase version of that. This yeah. person, this person wrote, I don't think you respect uh, people in wheelchairs. I, I, I don't You're respect. Like, I am the guy in the wheelchair. <laughs> crazy. Or, or somebody else said, I use my kid for clicks. I'm like, I used to use them because he's cute. <laughs> so it's, again, I'm not famous and I'm not getting any, uh well I got death threats when I defended Axel Rose uh on his lawsuit then I would get death threats but anyway uh no that's that's it's sick because you're grieving and these people who don't know you are are attacking you for things that they think that they're so convinced they're so convinced what they're saying is true and it's just like are you how are you al allowed to drive or to vote or to do any of these things when you this is just your, your sick mindset. So that's why you know I'm I'm glad to not only for us just to have this important conversation, but just to get these things out. And I'm not pressuring you for any of these answers. You could I said say whatever you want, say whatever you don't want to say. I I have that respect for people because it's it's so hard to be to be interviewed about this. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I'm yeah. like, I'm like, keep so, it calm, Jamie. Don't go off. <laughs> I have to. I have to do that sometimes. I'm like, I guess I get, I get hot real quick. <laughs> I, I don't know. I have a Napoleon complex, I guess, because I'm five six. But still, no. I guess I hate when people say stupid things. I'm just like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> what is wrong with you? So uh, it's, uh, well, I, I appreciate you all, you clearing all that up because the, again, these are real things. It yeah. can happen to Scott Wyland on stage. It can happen to my dad eating an ice cream at the kitchen yeah. table. It's it's just scary and yes my dad needed to be medicated but he wasn't on the right thing or wasn't seeing the right therapist you know what's crazy him he would used to tell his therapist like oh i'm gonna kill myself one day but you know i'll just disguise it as a heart attack and the therapist would laugh being like oh you're not gonna do that I'm like that number one thing that therapists do is they do that check-in with you and it's the number one question do you have thoughts of harming yourself or other people it's I didn't take him seriously and somebody who saw he saw for a long time and obviously because it happened didn't take him seriously but i know if i said when i have said anything like that to my therapist she's like i'm gonna send people to your house and take you away if if you i'm gonna, I'm gonna do that if you don't stop talking about this or don't stop doing this so it's uh Doctors, you know, I'm not trying to just, there are good doctors, there are bad doctors. There's good medication, there's bad medication. Uh, yeah. 
it's like, where do you even go from here? So I, I, I live every day now. Cause again, this is a cloak that I thought would, I thought I would never get married, thought I would never have a kid, but I'm going to hear I am. I mean, not now because they've abandoned me for a week, but, <laughs> but in a good place in life, getting to speak to people like you, you know, this is, I have a radio job, but this is a passion project that people love. And, uh, you'll appreciate this. Let me just share a message I got. Um, this was on the, the interview that I did with again, Jacoby and, and Daughtry. And yeah. so that was only for like 10 minutes. So I spoke after a bit, kind of just me talking to the listener yeah. and like, okay, who cares about me? But you know, I need to finish this. This is not just a 10 minute conversation. Let me just finish this. So, uh, and this was a DM, so I'll protect the, uh, the guy's name. Uh, hey, man, just finishing up the episode from uh, May 31st. Thanks so much for addressing mental health. I'm an ordinary 43-year-old dude who loves Guns N' Roses and loves my 13-year-old daughter more than anything. Thanks for reminding me that she'll always need her daddy, much like you will always remember uh, your father. Sorry for your loss, brother. I can feel your pain through the pod, but also see a strong, proud man who would do anything for his son, wheelchair or not. Keep kicking ass and giving us great content and interviews. We may become fans of yours for the personalities and catchy pod name, but we continue to listen because you keep it real. Uh, God bless your family and keep taking care of that beautiful family. So uh, thanks, man. Who uh, I got a few messages like like that. And that's why, you know, it was it was uh, fate, Jamie, that we're talking now because it's, it's so to lift the curtain a little bit. Because I can't always will ask how I book interviews, sometimes through my job, sometimes through email, social media. I messaged you on social media like a long time ago. Forgot, yeah. it, forgot about it. I mean, it happens. And you respond. Oh, you see, I'm sorry. You're really sorry? I'm sorry. I never saw it. Oh, I no, it's fine. I didn't see it. My friend just took over my social media because she knows I'm terrible at it. I'm awful. I am the worst. I don't check messages. I hate posting. It gives me anxiety. I don't want to see people's comments. <laughs> <laughs> me too. And why, why do I have these things? Anyway. She took over everything. And she had messaged you back before she even talked to me about it. And I was like, I was like, did she just sign me up for an interview? And she's like, yeah, you need to do that. And I was like, okay, all right. But then I looked, I looked at what you've been doing and I'm like, okay, yeah, that's cool. I want to do that. I like him. I want to. So. I appreciate that. Thank your friend, first of all. But yeah, yeah I, I didn't know. I, I Sometimes I send out interviews, uh, requests, just in a, a massive, like, okay, here are people I can talk to and forget about it. Uh, so I didn't remember. But then of course, with now with the, Oh, uh, it was just the anniversary of, of I believe, of, of Scott's passing, and uh, uh, not too long ago, and uh, my my dad's passing, and just to be able to kind of bring it together and have this conversation, because you know, again, as you saw from that listener's uh, comment, I heard from this, that listener's comment, I talk about it often, and it's it's hard not to. It's, it's hard not to being myself when you're talking about. Guns and Roses, like they're all crazy. Well, you know what? Let me just ask that because I always do a six degrees of GNR bacon. That's what I call it. I know there's the Velvet Revolver connection is the immediate, but are you a Guns N' Roses fan? Have you ever gotten to see them in concert? Uh, any I've never seen them in concert. My fondest Guns N' Roses memory is hanging out next to my friend's above ground swimming pool my maybe my summer before my freshman year of high school. And listening to November Rain, like on repeat, on a cassette tape, and we'd have to like keep hitting the button to rewind it. But that it was like the summer of Guns N' Roses, with sun and in my hair and baby oil on my skin, and just trying to be blonde and tan, which I am neither of those things. <laughs> um, but yeah, I have those are my fond Guns N' Roses memory, and um, and as far as Velvet Revolver goes, I love those guys. I love those guys. I mean, Dave and Duff and Matt, they're just like the sweetest. And they were, they and their wives were so amazing to me when Scott passed, like just very kind, very supportive. I'm so grateful. Like they really, they really helped a lot just with their generosity of spirit and, and kindness. So yeah, I've had Susan uh, uh, on a couple times. Susan Holmes McKagan, and she uh -huh. is awesome. Yeah, 
she's awesome. I've only met her a couple of times, but every time she's just, she's wonderful. So did he yeah. ever, I mean, this is just, you can not know this or not, but did he ever talk about velvet about, you know, wanting to maybe being unhappy how it ended or he just moved on. Um, there was a lot of talk about getting VR back together. He still was very optimistic that STP was going to get back together with him as a singer. Mm -hmm was very optimistic about it and um he felt like you know at that time he's like now isn't the time but i can see it happening so but i will say this because there are so many you know scott wyland uh fan groups on facebook and there's a lot of like there shouldn't be an stp without scott and i understand their passion and their you know fondness for him but i've always said too that you know, the DeLeo brothers and Eric Kretz, it, it's their project too. And this is how they are maneuvering life and paying for their kids to go to college and their mortgages. And they're so talented and they were 75% of the band. So rock on guys. Like I'm happy yeah. for that. Right on. Yeah. No, I, I feel the same way. I know it's always a conversation with a lot of bands. Some of which have no original members, but it's like with Alice in Chains, you know, they're, they're people too. And for them to just to stop their lives. And I think of STP. I mean, they had Chester as a singer for a while. I mean, those guys have, oh, I've lost people. Those, those, I mean, that, that demographic of rock star, I mean, ha have lost a lot of friends there. So oh. and anyway, uh, Jamie, I really, I can't thank you enough for this conversation today. I know it was, it was difficult. It was emotional, but I hope I, I, I saw, we got some laughs. And that's always important to to have. Um, yeah. And please like share before we go, like what you're doing. I know you're not, a, I know you're on Instagram, but you're not very social um, on there, but what are you doing now? I need to do my social media because I can't. Well, um, I mean, yeah, get your friend to do it. So like, yeah, what are you doing now? How are you staying creative? What's, uh, what's going on in your, in your life right now? I paint every single day and um, I'm launching a, so I started working for a staging company. Um, so we, if a house goes on the market, um, we work with realtors and we come in and we put all the furniture and the art and the rugs and the lawn. We make it, we make it really beautiful to go on the market. Um, and because I had been painting before, one of the first houses I worked on, we needed a piece of art and I just kind of threw one together. And the woman that owned the company essentially said like I need you making art for me like exclusively so I started just exclusively making art for a staging company and now I'm launching my own staging art company so that's what I, I'm painting my other my other you know my seascapes and my landscapes and my portraits too but really I'm doing staging art and I love it it's really fun that's it's cool really, yeah your, your own little niche right there yeah it's, it's little kind of like what I <laughs> But I have my little pocket and I, and that's, you get all out all your creativity and there's a demand for it. And it's, uh, that's very cool. Yeah. No, I, I, I really love it. And I am very fortunate that I, my studio is my garage was is my backyard essentially. So I just walk out the back door every morning and come out here to the garage and I've got my dogs with me and I put my music on and I'm usually never wearing anything this nice. I am constantly wearing paint splattered, funky clothes, and I dress like a 13 year old boy. Um, so do I? And, yeah. And my neighbors probably all think I'm crazy, but yeah, no, it's good. I'm happy. No, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And you, you deserve it. You deserve to be in a, in a place, uh, you know, somebody who's, <laughs> I don't need to rehash it. I mean, the fact that I'm in a good place, you're in a good place, it shows that. While we, we we don't forget, we still have this pain with us, we can live our life. And hopefully that becomes, I don't want to say an example, but it's there are people who need to like, okay, there's no hope for me. And that happens. I mean, I had that feeling for so long. And it's crazy now that I will actually literally see a commercial where it's a daughter talking to her father at the kitchen table. And it's kind of setting the scene like they lost the mother. Like, Dad, are you thinking about suicide? And he's like, it's been really tough. 
and I can't imagine what it would have been like if I saw that commercial because I didn't realize it was too late. Uh, and then same thing with you can learn from Scott's situation that you need the right people around you. You need to it's 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 so important from doctors to friends to bandmates. And it's sad that, yeah, you, you finally seem to have turned a corner. But it's, um, if there's any sort of silver lining in there, you know, it's to avoid this happening to, to anybody else, you know, from a rock star to a dentist, you know. A, a human, a beautiful soul that should still be here. Um, yeah. I will say this, too. I, um, I had some newer friends came over last night for dinner and um one of the guys asked me um he said what was he like like would i have liked him and would he have liked me and i said well let me preface this by telling you the same thing i tell everyone that comes into my house he's here he's here in some version his energy is always with me. And um, and then I did answer his question. I'm like, you would have liked him and he would have liked you. I promise you. But it's, it's also, you know, you have to let them go. But yeah. you also have to keep them alive. And whatever that is. Like for me, it's... I listened to his music a lot. I couldn't for a long time. I would be in like a grocery store or a restaurant and an STP song would come on and I would have to go outside and stand in a parking lot and cry. Like I couldn't even hear his voice, but now it's it's really shifted and I welcome it. And, um, but he's definitely, he's with me and I know that I'm going to see him again. And you're going to see your dad again. You know, I always like that. Uh, we bonded a, a pretty well over baseball and I couldn't watch the Yankees. I'm like, I can't. And now, you know, I embrace it. I can't wait to take my son to a game. So yeah, this is a, it's a common thing that people, you know, the go through that they're, you got to find that ba balance of you're keeping them with you. Uh, but you have to separate in order to live your own life. Yeah. Cause it's, then you're just, you might as well be gone with them. And we don't want that. So I, I think it's important to just see how they show up in your life. The little things that remind you of them. Yeah. Um, and for you, you know, now that you're a dad, thinking about the ways that your dad parented you, and now you're going to take those great things and you'll parent your son. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I have more appreciation of because you mentioned how Scott's silly was uh, my dad was silly. And sometimes because it's your dad, you're like, oh, dad, stop it. And now <laughs> I am a nutcase around him. And I know I'm going to be I'm like, all right, now I get it. Now I get it. It's like you see your little boy and you just want to kiss a kid's face and then yeah. really sound. So I know I'm going to be a weirdo like my dad was. And uh, I'll tell I'll just tell him. Hey, I didn't like it, and now I lost my dad. So I don't make him feel bad. No, I won't do that. Uh, but you, you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, I know what you mean. No, I. My son is twenty years old, and I still want to go. Arr. And I'm a total. We are complete goofballs together. It's we have a lot of fun. So yeah, glad to hear that. I, I, my youngest brother, who's he's not even is he thirty? God, I'm so terrible. No, he's not even thirty. I still call him the baby. But I'm like, he's like, you have a baby now. I'm like, I can't help it. I still, you're still with that little 20 year old face. I still want to squish it. Anyway, okay. now, now we're getting off on a tangent. Uh, it's okay. uh, Jamie, I, I hope uh, to speak with you again, to come on again. You know, well, if Love you. this has been really great, I really, really, truly enjoyed talking to you. So likewise, like, likewise, this was an important conversation for me to have. And I can't thank you enough for your time because you don't have to do this. You know, you're not selling anything. You're just here in your own good nature, goodwill. So just thank you. Um, I, you know, I appreciate any opportunity I can to, to just let people know, you know, how truly wonderful he was and to clear up these misconceptions about him and the distortions. Yeah, so. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's, that, then, yeah. So. That's, that's what we do here. So that does it for this episode of Appetite for Distortion. When yeah. will you see the next one? In the words of Axel Rose concerning Chinese democracy, I don't know if soon is the word, but you'll see it. Thanks to the lame-ass security, I'm going home. <laughs>